Fungi are everywhere, but they're easy to miss. They're inside you and around you. They sustain you and all that you depend on. As you hear these words, fungi are changing the way that life happens, as they've done for more than a billion years. They're eating, eating, <clears throat> they're eating mm-hmm. rock, making soil, digesting pollutants. Should I take that again from the top? Yeah, why don't we start from the beginning? And then that, that was the dry run. Mm-hmm. And this is now. Mm-hmm. Fungi are everywhere, but they're easy to miss. They're inside you and around you. They sustain you and all that you depend on. As you hear these words, fungi are changing the way that life happens, as they've done for more than a billion years. They're eating rock, making soil, digesting pollutants, nourishing and killing plants, surviving in space, inducing visions, producing food, making medicines, manipulating animal behavior, and influencing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Fungi provide a key to understanding the planet on which we live and the ways that we think, feel, and behave. Yet they live their lives largely hidden from view and over 90% of their species remain undocumented. The more we learn about fungi, the less makes sense without them. Merlin, thank you so much. Uh, So this is uh, the beginning of your new book, Entangled Life, right? Yeah. The very beginning. Uh, so maybe we can start from the very beginning. Uh, we are here together, Filippa and you and I. Um, but actually, this conversation is quite uh, is quite ancient in the history of this particular event. In that we, you, you have played uh, quite an important part in the kind of advising and conceiving of what uh, this particular uh, edition of the Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish, the understory of the understory has been, as we will see or have seen throughout uh, the various conversations throughout the, the two days. And so I wanted to ask you, um, I believe, I mean, memory is a funny thing, isn't it? But I believe that we uh, came up with a subtitle, The Understory of the Understory, when we were working on this event a while ago. And then I found myself on summer holidays reading Underland, Rob McFarland's book, in which he quotes you in a conversation that you had together saying quite serendipitously and quite beautifully, I'm interested in the understory of the understory. So there was a kind of return, like a closing of a loop, at least in my mind, which I believe I wrote to you about immediately. But so I guess the question for you is, what does that mean to you? I suppose geographically, but also Kind of what are the various implications of an understory of an, of an understory? I think there are lots of ways you could read it. I have a feeling that what I meant at the time was, I think I was talking about the way that I hoped to uh, publish companion papers to all my scientific papers, a, a kind of dark twin paper where I discuss all of the, um, what I actually did to produce the data that I present coolly and neatly in the scientific format. So this backstage part, you know, the, the interactions, the boats breaking down, the muds, the bullet ant stings, um, just to give a sense of the, uh, the compost from which this scientific story emerged uh, to ground this scientific story and to, to, um, to situate it firmly in the living world. And so that I think what I meant was that that might be the understory. Um, and so given the papers about the understory of the forest, that this would be the, the understory of the, of the understory of the forest, um, and the, the backstage part, the hidden part. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's what I meant. And there's lots of ways and you could read it here um, uh, in terms of um, the various understories of the understories, you could flip them um, around and, and have a lot of fun with it. But yeah, I think it's a fertile ground. But isn't also, in a sense, don't fungi exist in the understory of the forest's understory? Don't they do that same thing that that your kind of shadow scientific paper would want? Exactly, yes. So so when you look at a forest, when we see a forest, we see mostly the, the, the visible outgrowths of these associations, the trees and the plants and the shrubs. But but fungi are playing in this uh, understory role in, in supporting the growth of everything that you see. Uh, and so this is why I felt it was so appropriate to, to do the understory of the understory papers um, for talking about 
fungi in particular, and mycorrhizal fungi are the ones that make so much of our, our visible surroundings exist. Um, talking about stories, um, something that I found fascinating in, in the book and in its narrative form is the way in which you approach um, science and you approach uh, scientific knowledge in a way that is uh, both extremely accurate but extremely grounded. This grounded could be a very bad pun. It wasn't intended. <laughs> grounded in, in, in personal experiences, in memories and recollections, in episodes that um, you go through. And I find uh, this, this balance between um, the, the sharing of scientific knowledge and its literal entanglement with your own, with your own uh, experience, with your own daily experience, extremely moving. Also because often you refer, um, or the way you approach this knowledge is also by establishing parallel um, parallel narratives to, to events that could be, or to situations or references that are more uh, approachable to some of us who may not be as an expert, which is difficult in, in, in Fangi as, as, as you are. And this led me to think about this characteristic, which is uh, both a limit and in my opinion, an expression of desire to get close to, to understand the other, being that the other, whoever that is, which is anthropomorphism, you know, in the sense, a limit, because we humans uh, have this propensity, this vice to reduce uh, behaviors and modes of existence that are so different to us, to something that we can understand, and therefore reducing them to our own scale and logic. But at the same time, it's... An, a propensity that is embedded very often in the desire to understand and the desire to 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 comprehend in a way that we have to reduce it in order to for us to understand what does it mean to be a mushroom or do, what does it mean to be a mycelium network and i wonder if you would like to to tell us a little bit about your own experience writing this book and understanding how to render your knowledge into something that can be captivating and appealing to uh, to audiences in relation to this difficult balance between um, establishing a, a, a parallel with, with humans and allowing those entities and those life forms to be respected and discovered by what they are. It's a real pickle. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a tension that I don't think is gonna go anywhere anytime soon, but I think it's important to spend time in this tension, to feel it out, to, to be tugged this way and that. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the basic pickle is, you know, to use anthropomorphism, when we anthropomorphize other organisms, uh, non-human organisms, we, we try to understand them using human terms, human concepts, and in doing so, we make it difficult to understand them on their own terms. Um, so there are a few problems with this. Uh, one is that when we try to avoid anthropomorphism um, studiously, uh, I was trained uh, in, the, in the natural sciences and, and there are all sorts of ways that we're uh, warned against using human terms to understand other organisms. Then too often, I think, we end up using quite mechanistic language to understand them. We, we frame non-human organisms somehow as uh, automata, as pre-programmed robots responding automatically to stimuli from their environment. And this, I think, is a, is a kind of cryptic uh, anthropomorphism because, because in this mechanistic language, we, we're making out these organisms to be machines, but humans are the only organisms to build machines. So I think we smuggle anthropomorphism in through our mechanism uh, and so um, get in a pickle that way. And, um, but I think at the root of our problem with this, perhaps, is, is what we choose to call human concepts in the first place. If you say another organism has feelings, um, and then that's being anthropomorphic, then you're suggesting that humans are the only organisms to have feelings. And that may well be what you think. And if you do think that, then that would be anthropomorphic. Uh, but, but it also may very well be the case that in your understanding, your opinion, your intuition, these organisms also have feelings. And if you say they have feelings, then, then you're referring simply to the fact that they're having feelings in their own way. Um, and so what we do there was we deepen and expand the concept of feeling to encompass all the different kinds of feeling that might exist in the living world. So 
I think our, our allergy to anthropomorphism speaks too often of, um, of a species narcissism and ex exceptionalism that prevents us from attributing uh, these qualities, these uh, um, abilities to, to non-humans. I like particularly as a way to work with it, as a way to actually in practice, um, uh, the work of Natasha Myers, who, who, who writes hilariously about Darwin and Charles Darwin when he is figuring uh, the, the lives and behaviors of orchids and orchid flowers. And he, she discusses the way that Darwin uses, he, he talks about orchid flowers in, in, the, in terms of a, a man's body. He said, no, this flower is a bit like a man bent over with his arm around the side and his hand coming up to meet the other hand, this kind of thing. And then you end up with this picture of, in your mind of Darwin um, standing there, balancing on one leg, uh, contorting his body into the shape of an orchid flower. Uh, and then the question is, is he it being, no, is he practicing phytomorphism? phytomorphism? Is he being uh, vegetalized by the flower? Is he trying to understand the flower on the flower's terms? Or is he you being anthropomorphic? Is he using the terms of the human body to understand um, that of a flower's body? And, and you end up in this uh, shifting space between the two. And, and, and I think it's quite uh, fun to, to exist in that uh, place where the arrow points in both directions at once. And we recognize that, um, that we are also influenced by the world around us. I absolutely love that you say this about, because uh, I think one of the things that has emerged through this series that we feel very strongly is the fact that actually anti-anthropomorphism is entirely anthropocentric as a position. And we've started to really think about sort of what does it mean to define a concept in your own image and then exclude out of that concept. Not, not only what does it mean to do that, exclude out of that concept, all of those things that don't fit, but how is that actually the template of how we deal with uh, the environment, non -human, more than human and non-human species, politics and everything is kind of the templates is you create something in the shape in which you are. And then slightly down the line, you assume that that, uh, that something, that shape is actually, is kind of an inherited like form that pre-exists you. So there's this kind of God, strange God comes. And, and one of the things that brought us to mind, and it's interesting that you mentioned Natasha, who was at the last fish, funnily enough, uh, or participated in it rather. Um, because I kind of feel that it's anthropologists that have done an enormous amount of um, work in the academic, uh, let's say Western, Northwestern urban academic field have done a lot of work in bringing that back to, to, to sort of look at it again. I'm thinking about Eduardo Con talking about things emerging out, like human things, meaning and whatever, emerging, being complex emergences out of other versions of the same, you know, that might be uh, meanings of the forest, in the forest and elsewhere. <clears throat> and um, that is a long winded way of agreeing with you, but also to sort of say one of the particularly uh, kind of exciting and amazing elements of entangled life is how much, um, you know, you situate your work uh, within a scientific and biological field, but how seriously it also takes alternative disciplines kind of uh, uh, worldings and how kind of it balances the needs of both as opposed to seeing science as the kind of gate past which some things that are truth pass and others don't, right? So there's a kind of much more relational thing between disciplines. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I, I really wanted to, to, to communicate the fact that so many different worldviews converge on these organisms, uh, on fungi. And, um, and, and because fungi are such relational beings, they, they form these connections, living you know, persistent connections between organisms. They actually you know, connect different organisms together, um, <clears throat> as well as striking up astonishing symbioses with all sorts of different uh, beings across the, the whole spectrum of the living world. <clears throat> I wanted to deal with our relationship as humans to these organisms. And I couldn't just deal with our relationship to these organisms if I spoke only about uh, the scientific um, the more scientific worldviews. Um, so I had to deal with, with all of them or as many as I felt I could and um, to do justice to the many ways that we have of, of relating, of knowing um, and of experiencing. Uh, that touches upon something 
that I found particularly interesting and, and exciting in, in the book, which is that almost at the end of the book, you, um, continuing with uh, the reflection on various traditions of, of knowledge, um, in which you, you, you refer to this extraordinary uh, remark by the Lozan Guattari in which they, they, uh, they praise uh, intoxication as the triumphant um, eruption of the plant in us, like a moment of celebration. Um, and, and it's one example of how something that became so naturalized in our culture, in our Western culture, such, such as that of alcohol consumption, for instance, and we don't understand that it, we could also see it as a constant ritual of welcoming uh, a, a fruit that has the capacity to take us somewhere else and to give us an experience that can, can, is quite unexpected and can range from, from a series of phenomena and a series of manifestations. Yeah? Um, and uh, and in, in, in general, this led me to relook at what you were writing and, and also reconsider um, different uh, fungi, and in particular, when you um, reflect not only about the most traditional ones we generally think about mushrooms, but also, for instance, yeast, as agents that have an outstanding capacity to enter us and to transform us, you know, and to have this, I almost imagine a party happening inside our organism that is, uh, it is, has a transformative, it's a transformative event for both them and for ourselves. And of course here I'm again anthropomorphizing, but um, in a celebratory manner, you know. Um, and, but what, what I thought was interesting is yes, intoxication or some kind of mind altering experiences are the most visible aspects of the ways in which fungi can uh, transform us. But isn't it, aren't we always permanently being altered, uh, being in symbiotic processes with the agencies, with the properties, with the mode of existence of different sorts of fungi within us? Yeah, I think there are lots of, lots of levels uh, that you can think about this. There's on the biggest, deepest picture, there is the evolutionary level where, where all of the ecosystems that sustain us, all of the plants that we eat, all of the plants that we use for their materials, um, these plants have evolved in concert uh, by, with fungi, with symbiotic fungi that have made their lives possible, made the whole evolution of land plants and the terrestrial biosphere as we know it possible. So um, in that sense, our entire evolution has taken place in the in this very fungal context, of course, plants as well and bacteria as well, all of these different kinds of, of being. And, um, and so there's that level. And then there's the level of the biogeochemical processes that are taking place in which we live all the time. So um, decomposition is a good example, fungi are decomposing. Um, and without their decomposing, we would you know the, the earth would be piled deep in the bodies of animals and plants. And so we live and breathe in the space that decomposition lives behind. This is one of the ways that fungi are, are, are always impacting our lives. Um, and, and plants also, because you know, they're, they're, they're playing a big part in these biogeochemical cycles as well. Uh, so then there's, there's those levels. There's a physiological level um, in the sense that fungi make up a part of our microbiomes. And um, the collection of microbes that live in and on us without which we wouldn't grow and behave as we do. And although the role of the microbiome, the fungal uh, fraction of our microbiome, is um, there's a lot of questions that remain unanswered. It's clear that our microbiome, the activity of these microbes change the way that we, we, we behave um, and, um, and can change the way that we feel. And so there's this very intimate level on which uh, we're being influenced by the microbes that uh, surround us and, and inhabit us. And then there's conceptual levels, um, like for example, lichens, the symbiotic organisms um, made up of fungi and other, and other organisms, bacteria and, and algae. Um, lichens were gateway organisms to the concept of symbiosis in biology in the late 19th century. And so really have sh shifted um, you know, modern scientific thought in a certain direction uh, by by illustrating 
points that um, then change the way that humans go about investigating the world and making sense of the world. And there are a number of examples of this. Um, the, this from a more modern lens, you can think about yeasts. Yeasts are these model organisms which, uh, and it's through our work on yeast that we understand much of what we do about uh, cellular life. Uh, since 20, 2010, more than a quarter of Nobel Prizes for uh, physiology or medicine have been awarded for work on yeast. And so the study of these fungi can tell us something about life more generally. And so in that sense, in the sense that we live in societies where this knowledge is applied uh, in, in endless ways and shapes the way that cultures and uh, politics happen, we live um, influenced by uh, these organisms in a, in a less direct sense. Thank you. Um, I have a question about death, but I'm trying to put some words around that, <laughs> that one word, which has to do with, <clears throat> I think in, uh, in the, in the thought that uh, Tim Ingold is bringing to this particular event, which I believe will be tomorrow for those of us who are following us on the, on the actual days, um, some of his reflections start from this uh, possibly erroneous interpretation of Giambattista Vico uh, of the word for human coming from uh, umando meaning to bury and whilst he also you know says it, it's probably not right because it might have something to do with the, on the earth you know with with humus which is the earth rather than burial but it did lead uh it did lead me to think a lot about um like our on a on kind of cultural and like big narrative level our the many uh, us that comprise the universe the the the, the planet right but our relative capacity to incorporate and make peace with maybe the notion of our own mortality and that same kind of cultural context having a capability to care adequately for the more than human world and I'm wondering if there's something there that like, if, if this, this idea of like completely pushing death away is also kind of pushing one's own place in the fabric of this kind of cycle of decomposition and the, in this fabric of complexity that to a certain extent, mycelium networks kind of, you know, accompany you through. And it's so funny because as I'm saying this, I realized that Philippe is allergic to mushrooms, which is very interesting <laughs> given that we're involved in all of this. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about this. I mean, the mushrooms and molds and fungi have a kind of strange relationship to, some humans have a strange relationships to fungus, fungi psychically. And I wonder if that has something to do with death in your opinion. Yeah, I think I think so. Uh, they've been so often associated with death and decay, um, rot, uh, damp, dark, and all this, all of these things that they love to you know damp and the dark. A lot of them they really need this to grow, and 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 the damp and the dark is these places are, are places that humans may often um, try to avoid. Not always by any means, but. Um, but certainly in, in their association with, with dead bodies, dying um, organisms, and um, in the way that they visibly create decay, then I think they have been associated with, with that aspect um, of, of these ecological cycles. But of course, it's only through that process that new life is able to form. So it's, it turns on, on that perspective um, and they, can digest things and break things down, but in doing so create the conditions for new life. And I think it just depends which aspect of that you, you choose to emphasize. Um, but I think maybe some of the, perhaps the, the cultural uh, mycophobia that we have is definitely to do with their, um, their association with, with I, these aspects of life that we'd rather avoid or that we find disgusting. <laughs> but there's something about this, like being the end of the line or being a part of a circle. Like we never think of, there was, Martin Rees gave a talk ages ago and he said, oh, we always think of like a human as a species that's not gonna change, but obviously we're as, as Im 
in the middle of a process of trans of evolu co evolution evolution transformation or whatever and and it just kind of and we th we tend to think of the end of of the contemporary time as always a kind of end of history moment we tend to think of lines with us at a kind of end point as opposed to inserting oneself or being like a temporary part of something that is more of a cycle so i wonder if it's not it's not so much the kind of either it's good death or it's bad decay or like either it's good life renewal or it's bad decay but it's more like you're kind of on this it's kind of just you have to be in this in this it's you're sort of in the middle all the time somehow mm -hmm. yeah in the loop and I, I think these these um judeo-christian narratives of of linear progress really have shaped a lot of the way that um we think about evolutionary um, development um, and if you spend time perhaps more in a, a Buddhist or from a, come from a Hindu, Buddhist or Hindu background where cycles are everything um, then you might have quite a different feeling about about how this all works so I think yeah I think our, 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 our tendency to see things as, as linear uh, progressing uh, sequences of events uh, with neat chains of, of cause and effect I think this can lead us into some some pitfalls that's beautiful that you say because it also makes me think about the passage where you are speaking about the existence of composers and decomposers and this made me smile thinking about your family and the presence of music in your family as well and made me think about decomposers as an alternative mode of of, of musical composition in a way and since we're, we have to wrap up, I wonder if you would like to read us a, a, a fragment of, of that section, which also framed so beautifully what Lucia was, um, was um, asking you and which several I'm other trying, speakers will... will <laughs> <laughs> which several other speakers will also speak to. I know uh, Lynn Body, for instance, would also uh, praise the importance of the decomposition um, agency of, of, of Fungi. So I wonder if you would like to either to tell us something about it or to end with a reading of, of that section. Of course. Let me just find it. We had so many other uh, huge questions like one of them that perhaps doesn't have an answer whilst you search was um, had to do with why is it that the defense programs always have the most sort of advanced material innovations project because there's obviously a part in your book where you speak about uh, the, the uh, I guess the American military or the, uh, the kind of advanced defense program that looks at using uh, fungi to build temporary emergency shelter or temporary kind of and I was like well that you know they're always they're always you look at the beginning of something and they're always there somehow like the internet mm. now, I think there are a few reasons I mean one might be that things that are invented during um, wars like radar for example then they're enormously accelerated because of the imperative of war and the, and the life or death implication of success or failure in, in, in this technological process. But I think also sometimes you see the development uh, quite, uh, <clears throat> you see this kind of progress happening in um, through military research because there's, there's more of an emphasis on what works. It's not about the paradigm. It's not about this sort of general um, school of thought about how we think the whole world. It's, I think, what works? Does this accomplish that? If it does, then we can use it. It doesn't matter whether or not it should work or not. You know, there are, like, for so example, the um, psychic spying division of the US military during the Cold War. Most scientists were, <laughs> would have rejected this flatly. Uh, but for this military division, it, it didn't matter whether it shouldn't or should work uh, in theory. The question was, um, can we use this to our advantage in, in this combat, in this conflict? So I think maybe that's part of it, a kind of pragmatism that um, allows you to explore things that um, might not uh, be explorable in more conventional academic contexts. And possibly also quite copious amounts of funding. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, did you find the passage or did I just distract you? Yeah, yeah, no, I found the passage. Um, Uh, 
So I'm describing my puzzlement at the way that decomposition happens, that piles of leaves that I like to, to hide in as a child, how they, how they, would, they would disappear over months. Um, were they sinking? Was the, you know, how, how could they sink into the solid sea of the, of the soil? My father proposed an experiment. We cut the top off the clear plastic bottle. Into the bottle, we placed alternating layers of soil, sand, dead leaves, and finally, a handful of earthworms. Over the next days, I watched the worms wind their way between the layers. They mixed and stirred. Nothing stayed still. Sand crept into soil and leaves crept into sand. The hard edges of the layers dissolved into each other. The worms might be visible, my father explained, but there are many more creatures that behave like this, this that you can't see. Tiny worms and creatures smaller than tiny worms and creatures still smaller, they don't look like worms, but are able to mix and stir and dissolve one thing into another, just like these worms can. Composers make pieces of music. These were decomposers who unmake pieces of life. Nothing could happen without them. This was such a useful idea. It was as if I'd been shown how to reverse, how to think backwards. Now there were arrows that pointed in both directions at once. Composers make decomposers unmake, and unless decomposers unmake, there isn't anything that the composers can make with. It was a thought that changed the way I understood the world. And from this thought, from my fascination with the creatures that decompose, grew my interest in fungi. This is, this is beautiful. It's a, it's a wonderful, it's a very visible also <laughs> moment of the book. And I think it's a wonderful place to to wrap up our, our talk. Thank you so much, Marlene. Yeah. Thanks for having me.